Hi, everyone. Deborah Gold here, Executive Director of Balance. Before we begin, I just wanted to hop on and say a huge thank you to all of our donors in 2021. Support from our donors makes a real difference in the lives of our clients, and it includes initiatives like this podcast, which is aimed at helping people with sight loss everywhere in the world. We hope you enjoy listening as much as we enjoy making these shows. If you do, please consider making a donation. The link can be found in our show notes. Happy holidays and enjoy the episode. Welcome to Living Blind. I'm Ramia Amuddin, your guest host for the next three episodes of this podcast. The Living Blind podcast explores the perspectives and lived experiences of people with low or no vision and delves into the barriers, challenges, and real-life strategies that they have for living life to the fullest. This is the start to a three-part series on the intersections of blindness and other lived experiences and identities. This podcast is brought to you by Balance for Blind Adults, located in Toronto, Canada. And this season of Living Blind is sponsored by Accessible Media Inc., AMI. A bit about me to begin with, I'm the co-host of Kelly and Company. This is the live afternoon show on AMI-audio, and we focus on everything from lifestyle to arts to culture and entertainment. I'm also the host of AMI-audio's new podcast called AMI-audiobook review, and this is a weekly chat where we talk all things audiobooks. One of my friends and a very incredible member of the blind and low vision community is Wendy Ho Lee. And we're going to get to know her a little bit on today's episode of Living Blind. So, Wendy, welcome to Living Blind. How are you? I'm doing very well. That's great. And I'm really looking forward to chatting with you because we've known each other for several years now and uh, came into each other's context in different ways. And now I've gotten to know you a little bit, but I want our listeners to know a little bit about you and the things that you do, the work that you're up to. So you started, let's talk about your vision first. You started losing your vision at age 17. Can you tell us first what your diagnosis is? Well, my diagnosis is limbo stem cells deficiency, which is um, a damage from a contact lens using, and it's a scar tissue on the cornea that affected the vision, and later on it built up, and I had a couple of surgeries on and off, and right now it's stable, but I'm legally blind. So before 17, did you have moments or times in your life or other kind of checkups where you knew that this may be a problem or was it all very new as a teenager? It's all very new. All of a sudden in one day, I lost my, I lost my sight on the left eye. Okay. And how about your right eye? My right eye, I started losing it a year later when I was still able to drive and all that. And suddenly I started realizing, oh, my right eye started uh, declining with my sight. Then I went to my ophthalmologist again and asked her, is it anything related to my left eye? And that's when my life turned all around. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm going to go back to something you said. You said that you were driving. So you're a, like here in Canada, we drive at 16, right? Or at least that was the thing. So you'd been driving for like about a year or more than that before you started realizing, uh oh, my life is changing drastically. Yeah, I've been driving. I got my license when I'm completely fully sighted. And then I believe it was half a year later, I lost my sight in one eye. However, I would still drive with my other eye, right? Because it's legal to drive with one eye only until I lost my other eyesight. Wow. I, this is a big point because um, a lot of us who are blind or low vision or have had to go through significant vision loss really take driving as some, you know, huge piece of information. It's a huge thing that so many of us either wish we can do or had done at one point that we miss so much. It, it makes such a, a crucial difference in our lives not to be able to drive anymore for anyone who has. Um, so talk about your vision since then, your journey. Uh, you talked about like having a few surgeries done. What's happened between 17 and now? 
Oh, a lot have happened. I had a several of surgery. A few of them are um, some trans uh, transplant, uh, getting uh, stem cells to transplant to the eye, and 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 then it's been a while. I think uh, I would say a epithelium transplant. That's what I did. Just getting some donors uh, of an epithelium and placed it in my and my cornea so that that could help me with my vision a little bit. And it did it increase my eyesight quite a bit um, from probably like 2,400 to 2,300, 2,200 fluctuate there. That That's the number that I fluctuates for a few years. And I also did like a buccal mucosa epithelium transplant. It's been like 10 years I have done that surgery and it's basically um, getting some um, cells from my own mouth to to regenerate it and and put it in my eye and hopefully that will help with my stem cells because that's what my dis- diagnosis is limbo stem cells deficiency yeah and then another one that I, I forgot already <laughs> what it is but it, it's it's all about helping the epithelium epithelium to be healthier again so that I can um, maybe stabilize my vision. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of people, um, having the opportunity to A, be diagnosed, right, to know what your eye condition is and to know, okay, this is what's actually happening is a huge shift in attitude uh, because there are people out there who don't know what their eye conditions are. And um, I have some friends who, you know, they go back and they have regular eye visits with optometrists, ophthalmologists, um, all kinds of medical specialists, and still can't be told what exactly their eye condition is. But the opposite side is this, where you have several different things that you're working with, so many surgeries, um, some surgeries that have helped, some not so much, and you've doing it for years, like throughout your 20s, you mentioned a a decade's worth at least of surgeries. What keeps you going for the strength in terms of like dealing with the pain, the medical visits, uh, all of that? Well, for me, um, my faith really helped my life to know that there's hope in life. And what I have it's temporary and one day it's gonna be different and I'm gonna be um, better again but meanwhile when I'm here you know uh, there's still hope right there's still other things opportunity out there for me to grow and um, being able to know balance for blind adult three years ago was a blessing to me and um, overcoming lots of obstacle that I come across on the street, being able to use the cane and just um, finding my independency again. That's, that's, um, that's what, where my focus is on now, that I can bless others with the gift that I have, with the skills that I have learned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And for a lot of uh, the time that you've been going through surgeries and hoping for um, maybe some vision recovery, you've also been learning how to be a person with low vision. Is that accurate? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I guess I can always compare myself being sighted and visually impaired um, because during the 13, 14 years, I also got opportunity to have like a piece of contact lens to put in my eye that I can see 2030 again with my sight and just being back and forth with legally blind and being able to see again, really um, is a learning curve for me. And I I do have um, adaptive technology that I learned to continue to be connected to the world and society. Fantastic, Wendy. I want to ask you one more question in regards to your uh, eye condition. You mentioned chronic pain. And I want to know, because to me, it's really uh, one thing to have low vision. And it's another thing to all the time be reminded of it because of the pain that you're going through from your vision condition. So how does that play 
in your day to day life, in your um, your concept of hope and and trying to be, you know, courageous through it all, uh, but still having to deal with chronic pain? I guess dealing with chronic pain, it's it's tough. It's definitely a, not an easy curve to to go through. However, I, I tried my best to to distract myself with positive energy that 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 can put into my life, whether it's building friendship and, and connecting with other uh, people that come across vision loss as well or people with other disability and to encourage each other and to be accountable um, and also find the times of stillness and rest. Right. And that's very important to recharge and and to be um, to to be able to get my minds off my um, eyes a little bit and focus on to something else and and then come back to it the next day and know that there's still hope in life and there's still joy in life, despite the fact that, yeah, I'm pain. I'm in pain. I'm in eye pain, but I'll do my best um, to to rest and come back to the next day to work on it again. What's your support system like in dealing with that? Well, I have a lot of uh, church community friends that I connect with, as well as um, quite a bit of uh, people that walk with me also with low vision. And I'm a Cantonese speaker. Um, so I do have um, that part of uh, my organization that I was doing a lot of volunteer work with um, that has sight loss with, with um, Cantonese speaking. So that's also part of my support group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's really important to find community. And there's always a, a bit of me that thinks, you know, no one will understand exactly what you're going through. Everyone's journey is very, very individual. We're all on our own walks of life. And like you said, we need to take the time out for stillness, for quiet meditation, um, to be able to come to terms with ourselves, right? Our bodies, our minds. And then there's nothing we can do without the help of others uh, and then you're you're talking about that with your communities your friends your family okay mm -hmm. i want to talk to you a little bit about um your journey and how that plays into your value system so you do a lot of work you talked about being a, a cantonese speaker and having some community support from the low vision community do you have anything specific to say on uh, diversity and what that plays in your journey? Yeah. So basically, as a person who who um, English is their second language, we often come across a lot of barrier, even in the mainstream um, mainstream platform that we come across with uh, with balance or with other support um, system. We might not. Uh, be able to speak the language. So um, what we do is we have um, our, our support system and we speak the same language. So if we come across anything that we do not understand and how to use technology, then there will be workshops that the organization will host. However, if, if we needed some instructor and we'll try our best to find a translator and to connect with either Balance or um, CNIB um, to help with, with our, our um, mobility. So do you find that um, in knowing all these different people, there's a lot that you can share and relate to or are there other things that make you feel like you can find community in these people i guess in terms of relating to others for sure um like we have the same belief and faith at the same time um we speak the same language and the mother tongue is in cantonese so we came from either Hong Kong or China, that's where we're from. And yeah, of course, when we're here in Toronto, often we get discriminated because of our skin color or our uh, language barrier. So we'll share those experiences that we have and 
and try to tackle it and see if there's other strategy that we can overcome the obstacle that we face. What's the significance for you in having this bunch of people who are either also low vision like you or going through some kind of um, vision loss or blindness versus the general Cantonese community in Toronto? Well, we'll see, for example, using adaptive technology, being able to connect with a group of people that has visually impairment and using um, and having Cantonese as their primary language. Some of us doesn't even know how to use English or read English. So therefore the support system could help us with te adaptive technology, knowing how to change our setting in our phone so that we, the phone will allow us to um, read the, the content in the phone for us in, in our own mother tongue in Cantonese or Mandarin so that we can still be independent and connect to the society. I think that's really one of them that's very crucial. And also how do we connect with the mainstream events that's happening through CNIB? So we would communicate and have our own little um, email list or a group chat that we have or um, workshops that we organize to know more about ODSP or other resources out there so that we can still be connected and con contribute to this to the community. So what I'm hearing is it feels like a very, very close knit um, community or group of people when you have, uh, you know, these kind of email lists or um, you're talking to each other consistently on how you can contribute out there. And how do you guys make sure to open up the space and invite other people in you know is there is there some kind of outreach that you do for other uh, low vision or blind people of cantonese background who may be looking for you guys mm -hmm. so uh our our organization joy beyond vision community we do uh send out emails we are right now trying to even send out emails to um the ccb or um other organization out there so that uh, even on the radio Cantonese uh, radio channel to connect with other um, people in Toronto so that when they listen to the radio or the newspaper they they would um, know that we're we're here and this is uh, the support system and we're we welcome everybody to join us that's so amazing. I, I always am fascinated by these little um, niche parts of the blind community in Toronto, because I find that the Toronto blind community is very, very out there. You know, you can hear us, you can see us, we're all over the place. Um, but then when we tap into these specific uh, ways that people are finding each other, it's so incredible and it never ceases to amaze me. So, Wendy, you talked about valuing the contributions that you put out there right either as a um, as work or a volunteer or just to make sure that people can hear what you're doing and you're giving people tips on technology and things like that how important is that for you to not just i guess in an opposite you know sit at home and and do nothing or feel like your life is not worth it mm -hmm. i think by encouraging others it's it bring it lighten my up my day a lot, right? It bring, brings me joy to see other people grow at the same time, so that I'm we're all not alone in this, and that's very important. Um, that's what I do in my daily base to just call each other up and check in on each other and just see if we need anything, right? And if if there's there's help that we need, we'll, we'll connect and we'll try to encourage by words or by action. You yourself yeah. are a very active person. Um, I know you through the Toronto Ski Hall and uh, through there, I found out that you're very, very adventurous and love to do a lot of outdoorsy things. So can you talk to us about some of the hobbies and things that you love doing? Well, I grew up as a dancer, so I love to dance. And on top, yeah, and on top, that's why I found out about Ski Hawk when I lost my sight. Uh, so I returned back to Toronto 
I found out about Ski Hawk, and that's how we met in Toronto Ski Hawk. And I also love to uh, attend them bike with my husband. So he's my captain. He's my eyes. And uh, I would say I'm, I'm an adventurous. I like to try everything. Um, hiking. I love hiking. So we went hiking in, in the fall, just even if I can't, um, see as good, you know, my, my friends will give me audio descriptions of what the scenery are like, or just help me out a little bit and just to educate each other. Right. And it's, it's, it's continue to be exploring what's what's around here and I love to cook that's another thing that I really love to do so cool what kind of dancing did you do uh I grew up doing ballet and then later on I was trying out contemporary dance and jazz a little bit and salsa when I got married yeah that's a few things I do um I love dancing I would even like dance in a small little studio size that I live in um, and still dance right now. It's amazing to know that there are parts of you that you um, are kind of reluctant to let go of. You know, you talked about having driven once and obviously that's not an option for you right now to be driving a car, but dancing is something that you had before you lost your vision and it's still a huge part of your identity. And I wanted to um, ask you before we start wrapping up things, you mentioned faith a lot throughout our conversation and you mentioned that uh, hope is a huge thing for you. Um, and you also mentioned, you know, being really wrapped in the, the Cantonese blind and low vision community and, and having that as a very great outlet for you. Uh, but also, how do you feel about stepping outside the blind community and making sure that you're still tapped into the world um, besides disability, you know, bringing yourself and your disability and your journey into the, the bigger, wider world and, and uh, interacting with people that way. Mm -hmm. um, I would say since my ha I have my two little dogs, five pound toy poodle, I would really, I would put that into my community that I see every day in the neighborhood, right? If they come to me and I can't see their face, I would explain to them, hey, this is my condition that I have. If you see my little dogs, please help me out that something they're doing wrong, let me out and uh, give me a heads up and be advocate, right? And uh, allow people to know my, my issue and my problem. And continue to find other um, volunteer work that I can do to connect with with uh, with others, and with my church community. Even they're off site, it right, and and keep educating them. That's that's my whole um, whole whole aspect of of my daily living is is to share and care for others, and just not forget even though I'm, I have my disability, but I'm still capable and beyond capable to, to inspire others around me. You're here. You have so much to offer, Wendy. Thank you so much for uh, giving us a peek into your life, into the things that you've um, dealt with and gone through, but also continue to develop in your own life. I appreciate you sharing with us this aspect of your journey. Thank you. That's it for this episode of Living Blind. Thank you for tuning in and getting to know Wendy Ho Lee. Special thanks to Executive Director Deborah Gold and the entire team at Balance for Blind Adults. If you liked what you heard today, subscribe and follow us on whatever platform that you're listening on right now. And we're also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Balance for Blind Adults. For more information about Balance for Blind Adults and our programs and services, visit balancefba.org. I'm Ramia Amudin, the host of today's episode, and this has been Living Blind. 